Discover prototypical track and turnouts with the Roadmaster Series from Oak Hill Model Railroad Track Supply. Proudly made in the United States, Oak Hill's handcrafted turnouts provide unparalleled detail and accuracy, giving your layout museum-quality track work at an affordable price. Whether fully built or in easy-to-assemble kit form, Roadmaster provides all the details of real track. Looking for a custom piece of track work? Oak Hill can help with custom turnouts, diamonds, crossings, and more. Check out all of their offerings on their website, ohrtracksupply.com. Find out how simple and affordable it is to get your model railroad product or service in front of our growing and amazingly engaged audience. Email us at aroundthelayout at gmail.com. ATLP Rewind. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Around the Layout, where model railroaders come to tell their story. My name is Ray Arnott. So glad you could join us. Joining me tonight from Springfield, Missouri, Mike Landis. Mike, welcome to the show. So glad to be here, Ray. Thank you so much. Hopefully it's cooler where you are. It's kind of sweltering here in the middle of Missouri right now. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're getting kind of this kind of, I don't know, It's it's been a strange summer. We, we had a ton of rain followed by some really cool and very comfortable. It's almost like September-like for a while. Nice. Okay. So, yeah, well, I'm was, jealous. <laughs> yeah, but then muggy today, some rain, but it's supposed to be some decent weather. What I'm really worried about is some sweltering weather because in a couple of weeks from now, we're recording this uh, on the 8th of August, just a couple of weeks from the NMRA National Convention down in yes, Texas. And absolutely. I'm not sure whose idea it was to do a national convention in August in Texas, <laughs> but uh, I'm sure I'll be sweltering down there pretty good, although there, there'll be nice AC rooms and everything. Yeah, and stuff. well, I'll be sweltering with you. I won't be able to make it for the entire uh, convention, but I'll be there for the national train show for a couple of days. So I'm, I may see you around yeah, and absolutely. Uh, I'll be enjoying that Texas heat right along with you. So. Absolutely. So looking forward to that and being down in Texas for the national convention look forward to meeting you in person down there that'll, that'll be great but i'm looking forward tonight to getting to know you and your model railroading journey so let's get to it let me ask you mike what got you started in the model railroading hobby well you know i feel like my story is very similar to other people's when i you know listen to the podcast right here uh, people ask me that question a lot and uh, as far back as i can remember i always loved trains um, and that goes back even to being three years old, getting a Fisher Price train. That was my favorite toy I had. I wore it out. My mom got me a second one. I wore that out. And uh, so as, as early as I can remember, I always loved trains. Um, they were always an obsession for me. Uh, kind of graduating from there, uh, my stepdad was in the Air Force. And even though I'm from Springfield, Missouri originally, and I claim this is home, we traveled quite a bit around the country, moving to different bases. And it seemed like no matter where we lived, we were always near a railroad track. You know, here in Springfield, it was, you know, being in Frisco, and that was my earliest memories. Uh, from there, we moved to Cheyenne, Wyoming, and lived very close to the Union Pacific Yards right there. Uh, moved from there, ended up in Sedalia, Missouri, which is the, uh, the basis of my layout. And that was an amazing place for a, a small rail fan child. Uh, you had the Katy Railroad that was also on the main line of the Missouri Pacific Union Pacific from Kansas City to St. Louis. So with that, you had Union Pacific trains, Amtrak, uh, Southern Pacific trains on trackage rides, some Rio Grande stuff. Uh, it was just a, an amazing parade. Uh, every train you could think of rolling through there. Uh, going back to the, the modeling aspect of it, my rail fanning and modeling is very closely intertwined, as you can imagine, with most people. Got my first Tyco train set uh, when I was about eight years old. It was the, the Chattanooga Choo Choo, and that was just on a little 48, uh, 4 by 8 piece of plywood running in circles. Had a blast with that. I mean, that was my, my entire world for that yeah. at that point. And I really never realized you could have a layout. Uh, it was, I had, I had to look this article up, but it was the Smithsonian Magazine in December of 1988 had a feature article about just model railroading and layouts. And I had never seen a model railroad or magazine at that point, or even a trains magazine, or had any realization that you could build an entire miniature world. Right. And so I, I got a hold of that magazine and just wore the cover off of it. It was just <laughs> in treads by the time I had looked over and over and so at that point, I realized I wanted to build a layout someday. 
And uh, we lived very close in Sedalia to the Katy Main Line. And I was enamored with that railroad line in particular. I don't know if it was the bright color scheme with the green and the yellow, uh, but compared to the, the Mopac and Union Pacific, just the, the Katy just, just took to me. Mm-hmm. And so as a young rail fan, I was there for the final years before, obviously, Union Pacific bought out the Katy, uh, took out the track. I didn't even realize railroads were ever abandoned until I yeah. watched that happen. Uh, that was a sad realization for a little kid, but... Uh, kind of had it along my lines uh, in the back of my head that one day I wanted to build a Katy layout featuring Sedalia and build several smaller layouts over the years, ones that I was not proud of. They were pretty pretty shoddy. They're not ones you take pictures of and, and put on in the internet because you're proud of them, but uh, just some Burlington Northern type layouts. I had one for Santa Fe, just freelance type things, just kind of honing my skills, trying to figure out what I wanted and and where to go from there. You know how life goes. You kind of take breaks from the hobby. You get back into it. And I always kept a pretty consistent rail fanning interest. Uh, but, you know, just getting busy with work. And, you know, I travel a lot for work. And I'm, I've moved a lot as an adult for work. It was during the, the pandemic uh, that I realized I had to revive that hobby to stay sane, in a sense. I mean, the world was kind of crazy at that point. I was working from home. I needed an outlet. Lo and behold, I had all my model trains uh, yeah. just waiting to be brought back out. And that's sort of what led me to uh, jumping right back in full force to it. And I've loved every minute of it. And I feel like uh, this time around, you know, the seriousness, um, you know, being able to connect with so many people has been great. And it's uh, I can't imagine taking a break ever again at this point, but you never know. Hopefully not. Right. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. It's, it, it's funny how, you know, we, we talk about with, with you know, as many folks as we've interviewed and the, the repetitive story of, you know, the, the, the childhood to, you know, and then all the, you know, they get to that high school college years and then mm-hmm. you're young adult and the family stuff or whatever the case may be where it kind of goes, but that, that the ember still always seem to stay lit it's not that many people that move away from the hobby all too much yeah, yeah. I, want to, I want to go back a little bit here yeah when you when you went when you moved in and your 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 memories of sedalia branch when you were a kid because mm-hmm. um, i know a lot of that relates to the layout that you're doing now and Correct. in one of your videos you were mentioning a building that you couldn't remember as a kid mm-hmm. but i want to ask about what you do remember in a little more detail what, what year did you actually end up moving to there i mean like what age were you when when that happened i was eight years old um so that would have been in 87 and so i was there for the the final two years of the katie as an independent railroad and then union pacific operated it after the merger but it was still fully katie for all visual reasons all katie locomotives uh and then before they stopped the operation of that st louis line and, and abandoned it so it was about about four years there so it was a very uh as a little kid i remember You'd hear the train coming through. wasn't a lot, wasn't a busy main line, but you'd hear the horns. I'd run out on the street, and I could look right down to the crossing. And my mom remembers yelling at me to get out of the street, you know, or I was going to get in trouble. But hey, that was the highlight of my day watching the Katy trains roll through. That's great. Did you understand any bit of it? Did you pick up any, you know, kind of, you know, what they were doing? And you know, when all these changes happened, UP buys them. Were you aware of this, or did it just kind of like all seem like all? kind of like in a straight line to you? Honestly, at the time of the merger, I I didn't really know a lot what was going on. Um, When I would see the KD trains go past, you know, you'd have the green locomotives. Sometimes there would be Union Pacific or Mopac engines as a little kid. You would see those. And I do recall seeing fewer and fewer of the green locomotives and more and more of the yellow Union Pacific. And then, of course, even some of the Mopac blue still mixed in there. Right. Uh, but I wasn't really sure what was what, what was going on. You know, you just see a hodgepodge of locomotives. And if, if you've ever seen pictures of the Katy from the late 80s, they had their green locomotives, but they had a lot of secondhand units, the Conrail units, the Illinois Central Gulf units. It was a very colorful rainbow. <laughs> yeah. And so I was used to seeing just all kinds of stuff rolling through in those consists. And I didn't really uh, know fully what was going on. At the time of the abandonment of the railroad, there was a lot of talk of converting it to a state park. And it was in newspaper articles that I read that I found out what was happening to the railroad, why the trains had stopped running. And yeah. um, at that point, it was the, the trains were, were done with. But uh, I was able to kind of have that basis of knowledge there. 
Yeah. So as far as you, know, you that your prototype is kind of going away and you start with a Tyco set, it's funny because it's the same set I started mm. with the Chattanooga wow. Choo Choo set. Oh, you know, yeah. it's, uh-huh. it's, I think it's pretty popular amongst our age. We're about a year apart. So, yeah, yeah it's uh it's it's funny but then uh so you have this set but then you start w- what leads you to your next set and what where do you start to go in, in more detail from like you know the chattanooga which maybe you had set up like you said kind of goes around and w- what what's your next step in the in the model railroading journey is even as a kid well you know being a little kid you didn't really have access to hobby shops there was not a hobby shop in sedalia um there was no internet where I could hop on and, and go into retailers right that and right. things like that. So uh, there were some hobby stores in Springfield. And so whenever I would come back to Springfield, uh, it was Trainland Hobbies was, was the main store here. So I'd come back to visit grandma and grandpa and they'd bring me down to the train store and I would start buying pieces here and there. Now, granted, it was still Tyco cars, Tyco editions. I hadn't even gotten into Atherton Blue Box, as basic as that was at that point. But just buying little pieces here and there, adding to my train, going from there. Um, and, you know, I just, uh, year by year as I got older and got into the hobby more, just kind of graduated eventually to Atherton Blue Box, for instance. And um, that seems like a lifetime ago, and I, I guess it was, honestly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Tony Cook would defriend me if I didn't ask you. Do you still have all your uh, old Tyco stuff? I do not have any of my Tyco stuff. I have all of my original when I was kind of getting into Athern, a lot of that stuff when I was about 10, 12 years old. But Tyco yeah. stuff, I can sit and name every car that I had on the train, the red caboose on the end. But yep. I don't have uh, any uh, of the original trains, unfortunately. Oh, bummer. But you you, you start with the Athern blue box. You're starting to build up and stuff. You, you mentioned, you know, you see this Smithsonian article that you're you're pulling apart. Do you start to build stuff after when, you know, as you're looking at this Smithsonian article and, and, and start to get new ideas? ideas and start to kind of apply them at any a bit there? I did. And obviously what I had was very primitive being a little kid, you know, when I, you know, just getting, starting to get scenery products. It was more than, you know, Hey, I can go beyond just having a bare piece of plywood, right. you know, and I, and I cannot recall the layouts that were in that on the cover of that magazine was a Lionel F unit, but uh, the layouts were just, it opened up a whole new world to me. And I yep. think I went down to the public library in Sedalia. They had some, some layout books there. And so just getting ideas on, you know, adding uh, turnouts and additional tracks and sidings. And it's just little by little, you know, you're evolving in, in your mind with a hobby as you're, as you're getting older and, and just being exposed to more stuff. There was even a, a model railroad club there in Sedalia for a short amount of time when I was a kid. And we were building a layout in a, an upper story of a building on the main street. And I can't remember the guy's names, uh, but I appreciate them taking me under their wing and bringing me to the train club meetings. And uh, I was able to get a lot of experience through that. One of the guys had a, a KD Railroad, an in-scale KD Railroad layout uh, wow. in his basement. And that was the first realization that not only can I build a layout, it can be a KD layout. Even. Right, so, right. About what yeah. age was that when you saw that, that, that N-scale layout? I probably would have been about 12 at that point. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So that's gotta be super cool. All your kid memories of seeing the, you know, the, the Katie in, in your hometown and now somebody's modeled it. And yeah, you know, I, I can, I can recall the first time I saw, you know, like HO scale stuff of locomotives I was seeing in my neighborhood, you know, it was like, exactly. Whoa, yeah. what's this? Yeah. Thing? This is a super cool. Right. So yeah, yeah, it must've been really inspiring to you. I mean, even though you, it took you a while to get there, it still must've been something that really planted a seed. Absolutely. And it was kind of interesting because at the time, uh, you know, having a Katie layout or modeling what had been my favorite, come to become my favorite railroad still seemed very far out of reach because at the time nobody was offering that I recall or that I'd ever seen locomotives painted in the, the, the Katie, the green and the yellow scheme. I remember seeing some box cars, uh, some cabooses, uh, but this guy had hand painted as far as I know and decaled all these KD locomotives. And so being a little kid, man, that just seems so daunting. How would I ever learn how to do that? Um, you know, I, I eventually got into some, some painting and decaling myself, but thankfully uh, the modeling gods have been great to KD modelers uh, in the last <laughs> handful of years. There's been so much great stuff right. come out. So well, that's, so uh, we, we talked about this, the, the, the hobby kind of goes dormant after a little while. Imagine the teenage years like everybody mm-hmm. else. And then you said it was really pandemic. So that was quite a while that you, you kind of stayed you know, away from the model railroading hobby. 
what what kind of kept the, the kind of kept it lit between say that you know those teenage years and then you know pandemic of the 2019 well 2020 really the yeah, pandemic yeah. era what what kind of kept those embers burning what was the were there was there rail fanning was there anything that you kind of kept a you know a little bit of a touch on yeah, I, I certainly did continue my rail fanning. Uh, I still enjoyed researching, uh, just reading about railroad history, uh, you know, digging into uh, obviously the Katy Railroad, but whatever historical railroads I can find. So that was great. Um, I always, yeah, I had a, had a camera in hand that I would, um, wherever I had moved to, wherever I was living for work, I got to ex- see a lot of railroads uh, doing that. I always, during that time frame, seems like I had a module of sort of okay. sorts in a spare bedroom. I would always have something that maybe like, you know, five feet of track that I could run a locomotive back and forth, maybe a building or two, uh, very basic, but just enough to have my trains out there. Uh, you know, I may get an itch once every couple weeks to go out there and fiddle around with it for an hour or two, but you know, you graduate college, uh, my, my two boys who are now, 20 and 21, but, yeah. uh, you know, that had little kids, little babies and, uh, just life gets busy. You know, mm-hmm. and we, we've heard that story over and over from people about, sure. uh, what, what happens there. Where did, where did some of your work travels take you? Well, like some of the memorable spots, especially for rail fanning, like what was some of the better spots to, that you ended up in your career? Well, my, my favorites were out in California, you know, being a, a young kid here and then finally getting copies of trains magazine, finding out about the big, rail fan spots out west. And so I had moved to uh, California for a handful of years. I lived in San Diego for a while, then in Fresno. Uh, but I got to see these amazing hot spots, you know, Cajon Pass, uh, Tehachapi Loop, uh, all the railroads in, you know, Los Angeles and, and stuff that I had just read about my entire life in these magazines. Uh, and they just seemed like they were in some faraway fantasy railroad world, you know. Sure, and I remember sure. sitting at uh, the side of Tehachapi Loop uh, for the first time and seeing a consist of, you know, it would have been BNSF at the time, the early days of BNSF, but a consist, you know, going through the loops and thinking, I'm actually standing here. You know, this is not a, a video or a book that I've seen for, you know, two two previous decades. That was pretty great. Cajon Pass, I spent a lot of time out there. I was not any sort of a professional photographer. You know, I, I you know, you see all these great photographs in the publications and books, people going out there and it was nothing like that. It was just out there, you know, tromping along these old paths and uh, just watching trains, just getting to experience different railroads other than, you know, UP or, or BN was what we pretty much had back here at home. So, yeah, seeing railroading on a big scale. I know I've come from, you know, small railroading, regional railroading here in eastern Connecticut. That's what I've seen my whole life. And the first time of seeing like massive class one stuff and you know wow. big trains you know it's like that yeah. whole, holy <laughs> mackerel you know it's just exactly really uh re- really awe-inspiring it really so, was so you you land in springfield missouri and, mm-hmm. and then as you mentioned the the pandemic hits where you know you're looking for something to do why did was it model railroading what, what, what was the real spark of that well, it was a couple of things that happened uh, in the years prior, uh, I believe it was in 2017, 2018, unfortunately, because the pandemic, those those years in there kind of seemed like mush. But oh, yeah. uh, I, I continued the rail fanning quite a bit and the historical research. And so I actually wrote and published a book on the Katy Railroad uh, oh, it's awesome. called, Show, called Show Me Katy. And it was focusing on the Missouri lines of the Katy. Lots of great Katy books out there, but the authors always focused on the busier parts of the line, you know, Kansas City, down into Oklahoma, down to Texas, for obvious reasons. And the line to St. Louis being a secondary route uh, was just literally put on the back burner for the most part. You might find a handful of pictures. And so uh, I published that book just, uh, you know, being my favorite railroad, wanting a project to do. And I had been collecting just details and information and photographs for several years. And so I finally got that book compiled, and I believe it was in 2017 uh, that we finally got that out there and sold out of that book. It was, it was an amazing project. I loved it. One of my favorite parts was getting to travel uh, for presentations about the book and meeting railroaders and wow. and, thing, and things like that. And so whenever the pandemic happened and, and I got back into the modeling, it seemed like an obvious choice uh, because I had literally spent years researching this line, and uh, that was uh, – you know, just something that I thought, well, you know, I can't recreate this railroad 
in real life, but uh, I really had grown to love it even more through those years of, you know, traveling to every town, you know, documenting stories, visiting railroaders, uh, looking at the remnants of the railroad. You know, a large portion of it's a hiking and biking trail now. There are some portions that are still under operation as a short line, but uh, it just kind of continued that fascination beyond that. And so it kind of moved from the pages of the book uh, into HO scale. I was first believed that you were talking about doing research and stuff kind of as a hobby, but this was not just a hobby. I mean, you you've been doing some serious stuff to write a book. When did you really you know, know that you had a book in you for this? I mean, where, where, where does that idea get inspired to say, not only am I going to research and I really love this, but I'm going to put, I'm going to write this down and, and, and publish it. Where, where does that happen? Obviously being a, you know, a radio TV broadcaster, I, I write yeah. for a living. And so I'm used to just yeah. writing news articles every day. Um, it finally dawned on me, I would say, as we were getting close to uh, the 30th anniversary of the Katy Railroad being folded into the Mopac Union Pacific fold right there. And uh, once again, just an interest in trying to find information and photographs about this and finding out there wasn't a whole lot, but the more I dug, the more I found out there was some stuff and there was an interest out there in, uh, out there for a book. And so that the that 30th anniversary, that the 2018, kind of gave me a goal of that that's a date to commemorate uh, to get this book completed and done. And so uh, I kind of worked on it. And uh, some people ask me if I'm going to do another book. I, I would like to. Looking back on it, I don't know how I did it. <laughs> it was a lot of work. It was a lot yeah. of work. And now knowing how much work went into that, I know some guys just kind of crank them out. And I've started to work on another Katie book and some other projects as well, but uh, kind of taking more of my time. I don't have a, a deadline of that, that 30 year mark to, to get me to, to motivate me at this point, but still doing a little bit of that for sure. Yeah, that's that's amazing, you know, to to be able to, you know, kind of investigative journalist kind of thing going on where you're digging into the in a historian, you know, to yeah. all those aspects that are just really fun to go back. I mean, you have a little bit of roots in it in your in your childhood of seeing this stuff, but now to really dig in and understand and know what you were seeing as a kid, as as an adult, and not only that, but write about it and share all that information with with uh, with it, with this railroaded community is really yeah. a cool thing. It, it was a lot of fun relieving, uh, reliving parts of my childhood as well, because these were things that I was, you know, seeing, watching these Katie trains going by every day, uh, you know, seeing some of the operations and some of the industries. But when you're a little kid, you don't have a camera. You know, at that point, yeah. most folks did not have a camera in their pocket like we do now. Yeah, well, yeah. And so it was just things that I saw and they were part of my memory. And as time was going on, things you kind of forgot about or the, the memories faded but when you start a book project and the slides start rolling in from across the country, even the world, yeah. uh, you see these things that you hadn't seen visually in decades. And you're like, I remember that. I, I have fond memories of seeing that, you know, particular building or, or whatnot. So it, it was a trip down memory lane, I guess, self-serving in, in that little aspect of it as well. Well, yeah, sure. I mean, it, it's just amazing. And I think you hit on yet another point they try to make in the podcast because I have a little uh, interest in doing some photography as well. And I always feel like, you know, in, in 2023 and I've, I've started, you know, maybe 2005, six, seven is when I started really rail fanning. And mm -hmm. as I'm taking these photos, it's like, man, I really miss the golden, you know, the, the, the golden era of, of right. railroading. But what you find out is the photo you took in 2005 was, you know, kind of a golden era to somebody in 2023. It's always like trying exactly. to capture. So it's history to somebody, you know, and, and, and it's meaningful to somebody, especially, you know, our age is, you know, yeah. the 80s, but somebody will say 60s or 50s, but the 80s and the 90s, and they're all behind us now. And, mm -hmm. you know, so has railroading changed dramatically in those times, too. So so what, yeah. what you're able to capture and what you're, you're able to document in a book is really great because now, you know, that's history captured. Right. Yeah, exactly. And, and that's kind of interesting that you mentioned that. And that's one thing that you learn as a rail fan as time goes on. Because I remember being a kid and at that point, the golden age would have been the steam era. Yeah. And steam trains were cool, but I had no connection to those. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, they were trains. I, I liked them. But the only steam locomotive I saw as a child was one year uh, the 8444 came through mm -hmm. uh, uh, Sedalia on its way. I think it was to 
an event in St. Louis. Might have been, I'm, I'm guessing, 88, 89. You may, you may know, but some of the listeners may remember. But it came through Sedalia and, and made a stop. And that was the first time I ever saw loco- a steam locomotive. Mm-hmm. And the only time I saw a steam locomotive, probably till I was 30 years old again. You know, yeah. So I, I had no connection to that. But now it's funny what I have is... The, the great memories of the 80s, as you mentioned, I run into younger folks at, uh, you know, the train shows and, you know, to them, you know, an Amtrak, you know, P42 carrying a bunch of super liners, you know, that's that's amazing. And that's what they remember. Yeah. And so it is kind of funny how it morphs from generation to generation. Absolutely. Yeah. The, what we what we remember is old to them. What's, what's old to, or what's new, old to us or new to us is older than that past generation. It's just exactly. Yeah, it's it's amazing. But, but awesome that you, you a, a book uh, about the Katie and now you have all this information, obviously, on paper and a lot of it in your head and you've got all this. So. Yeah, now you're talking about, you know, after you write this book, now you're now you're going to apply it into a model railroad. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's it's one of those things where, you know, I had the documentation through the book. When I wrote the book, I had no intentions of of building the layout. You know, maybe it was going to be a freelance layout of the kitty or something. But uh, I was like, you know, why not do my best to create this? And what I, I kind of tell folks is. It's a little more detailed than proto freelance. Um, I'm a very detail oriented person. And if things don't look exactly like they do in real life, I I would get frustrated. And so I realized I couldn't take an exact approach. And and I realized that when I'm measuring something, for instance, a grain elevator, you know, I I do measurements of a grain elevator to take it. And if I don't get it uh, exactly spot on, I would get frustrated. But then I would realize, you know what, probably nobody on this planet knows that the eave on that grain elevator is 34 feet wide. Nobody does. Absolutely nobody. Maybe one other person in the world. And so if it's one foot off, you know, as I'm doing it, do my best and, Mm -hmm. you know, make, create something that's going to, you know, inspire somebody to realize, Hey, that's what that, that structure is right there. Yeah. Uh, But just, just to have fun with it. I I had to learn um, somewhere around the edges how to have, have fun with it because you can get really caught up. I wouldn't have called myself a nitpicker or a rivet counter, but uh, th- there may be some signs in there that that could have developed into that bad habit, I guess. <laughs> well, I, I think, that, you know, with, with you doing so much research and knowing so much about it now with with that process, it must be hard for you to kind of let go of some of those details, too, because like you said, being so detail orientated that, you know, where where can you personally draw the line? Right. And say, I'm OK with this. I'm OK mm-hmm. knowing that isn't exact, but it's OK. And sometimes I know for at least for me that can be a battle. That's like a, you know, an internal struggle of sorts of trying to figure out what, what can I let go and what do I have to have exact? Right. Exactly. And I, and I've used this term loosely before I have a a good enough approach. And I don't mean that in the sense of I'm uh, being shoddy or not putting my most into it, but good enough, meaning everybody who sees that is going to know exactly what that structure is. No doubt about it. There are, you know, structures, things I've, I've built on the layout and I know, some things are not exact about them. And I sit there and think, wow, I, I, it catches my eye. Yeah. But then I'll post a picture of it and people that remember that building, go, oh, that's spot on. That's exactly. And I'm like, well, if you want to believe that, that's fine. <laughs> but but, it, but it's, it's good enough. It's close it's, enough. It's so close that there's no doubt about what I'm trying to recreate in that model. Yeah, it's a fair representation. Yeah, and, exactly. And that's what you, you're, you're looking to create. So, yeah. All right. So 2020, we're going to build. And obviously, I tell you, after all this research, it's got to be the Sedalia line, right? There's no other no no, no other choice. That had yeah. to be it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You've got way too much information, way too much history with this. Uh, yeah. yeah it's, it's in your heart and it's something you have to do. So uh, talk talk about, you know, where where you're going to build this and kind of how the plan develops to, to put this layout together. You know, where I was currently or where I was at the time uh, was just I had a house that I when I had uh, I had moved out of Springfield for another job, had moved back. And at that point, I realized, you know, before I get my career fully stab- established back here at home, not knowing where I was going to go, I'm just going to keep it as a, as a modular type thing. So I constructed down one side of my garage, just the small yard in Sedalia, uh, the Art Deco overpass over Highway 50. And once again, so many times I had had just a simple module and a spare bedroom or a garage for so many years. And it was going to be just something like that. You know, at that point, a lot of manufacturers had come out with more Katie rolling stock and locomotives. And I figured this is going to be a great 
uh, spot for me to simply, you know, just run some trains back and forth like I've always done. Maybe one day I'll have a big enough house. Um, mm -hmm. So things progressed. I ended up moving again. Uh, I decided, you know, I'm, I'm staying in Springfield at this point. I'm probably not going to move anywhere else. And so I signed on with my, my current TV station. They, they kind of own me through a contract for, for quite a while. I'm not <laughs> going good. anywhere. Yep. Yeah, exactly. And so I will um, kind of tell you about that. I, I moved into a larger house, had more space. Uh, it's not a perfect space. It's in a, in a pretty big two-car garage. Uh, basement would have been nicer. I'm still working toward that. But I had enough space to uh, expand my my representation of Sedalia and then also uh, kind of go a little bit farther than that. And so things have been progressing. I have quite a bit of, of Sedalia completed. Um, it's not 100% complete, but I have, you know, the trackage down, working on a lot of the details. I will eventually... Uh, model Sedalia at about 30 miles back south to Clinton, Missouri. Uh, that was the portion of the line that I had um, uh, the greatest knowledge of because it was was close to home. There are some other guys out there that model the Katy St. Louis line, but they model the more scenic portion from Sedalia towards St. Louis along the Missouri River. It had bluffs and huge hills and uh, you know, hung on to the side of the Missouri River, had a tunnel, the massive bridge over the Missouri River. That seems like the obvious portion you'd want to model. And there are a lot of guys that have great layouts out there uh, mm -hmm. that have recreated that. But my portion was the half of the Sedalia sub that was pretty plain. It was the plains of West Central Missouri, grain elevators and small towns. And what you think of more along the lines of Western Missouri or Kansas not quite as elaborate scenery wise, but I love Midwestern railroads. I love feed mills and grain elevators. Uh, I love covered hopper cars, I have way too many of those. <laughs> <laughs> and so modeling that Western portion gives me um, the ability to recreate what I remembered of that portion of the line and then also expand upon my other interest of those types of industries on that side of the state. Yeah, so you're going you're going for the for the Katie that you can relate to, not what everybody else, but what but what it meant to you. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. And so um, between the other guys out there uh, that have modeled the eastern portion, the western portion, for such a lightly trafficked, obscure line, I think we've kind of got it covered, or at least getting toward that at some point. I think so. Oh, that's excellent. So when, when you start to plan this, what, what area it comes to mind on the Sedalia line that it was like the most um, you were most excited to model? I would say the and you'll see photographs of this. The thing that I remember the most about the Katy line, other than it being near my house, was the Art Deco overpass over uh, U.S. Highway 50. When I was a kid, I, it was just so exciting to go underneath that really cool bridge and see the trains going overhead. Yeah. And that was actually the first structure I built before I even began building the layout. Wow. Uh, you know, it was winter time. I wasn't going out in my garage at that time. It, it was pretty cold. Right. And so I, I built that overpass and then kind of the layout grew around that. And so right around that area was the small yard the massive Sedalia Katy Depot, which I will get to when my skills reach that point. It was a very huge structure. Yeah. Uh, some of the older industries on the south side of Sedalia was an industrial park, and that's where most of the uh, real serve customers were in the 80s. So there were two parts right there on the north side, the south side, and that's what I'm representing right now. And what I have completed so far was those two ends in town, about a two and a half mile stretch to give me plenty of industries to, to switch out and represent that before I continue uh, building onto the layout from that point. I want to highlight a thing that you just said here about um, you're going to put off the depot until your skills develop. That's kind of an interesting point, you know, that you're, you're, you know, that you're in that learning process and that you're, you know, you're, you're learning how to model and, you know, picking projects that you can basically hone your skills on. What would mm -hmm. you say up, up to now has been your most challenging project? This is going to seem kind of strange, but I would say weathering. Um, yeah. I have a lot of guys that watch videos and say, hey, are you going to weather that engine? Are you going to weather those cars? I look at my cars and I know they need weathering. And that, yeah. that's one thing that kind of bothers me. But uh, over the years, I've tried honing that skill, but I can never get it to look exactly like I want. I can work on a locomotive or a car. I can get close to it. Um, you know, it was one thing, you know, maybe 20, 30 years ago when a blue box kit was 10 bucks. But you know, when you're you're buying those tangent hoppers that are fifty five dollars, they're, they're lovely. But, you know, there's there's less room for for a mess up on there. You know, you can't throw away a fifty five dollar car, for instance. So I do, you know, 
spray the shine off my, my cars with dull coat. I do, you know, chalk them up a little bit, but uh, that's one thing that I've, I've had a challenge with. I, I do it. I once again, uh, get enough of it done. I've got a lot of cars to go, but that's one thing that's in, in, in the process. Um, track work is fine. A lot of guys despise ballasting. I love ballasting. Uh, mm. So I've never really had too much of a, a problem with track work right there. Uh, my, my control system is pretty basic with DCC. I use an NCE power cab yep. for the size of layout. That's more than plenty. Perfect. Yeah. The first, uh, sure. but I, but I see a lot of guys when I visit their layouts that have these massive DCC systems with miles and miles of, uh, you know, cable and <laughs> Wi-Fi route. I'm just like, that's great. Yeah. Uh, if I'm staying with a railroad I model with two trains, maybe three trains per day, yeah. thankfully I'm not going to need to to have that. It, right. it might be kind of fun to learn at some point, but it gives me a headache to even think about that far down the line. So, <laughs> yeah, for sure, for sure. And and you talked about weathering, and you know, on the show we've had uh, weather my trains as a sponsor, and I recorded yeah. a commercial. And if anybody heard it, I said, like, you know, if any if anybody's like me, and you know, it, that that wasn't just a commercial. That's me telling you, I'm scared to model my stuff. You know, it's like <laughs> right. I, I've paid you know a decent amount for you know my rolling stock and my, my locomotives and. It, 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 it paralyzes me in fear, like thinking about, OK, well, if I don't get this right, how am I going to get all this stuff back off? And, you know, it's it's definitely, a, you know, something that you've got to work yourself up to and, and, and get some good practice in. Yeah, exactly. I've had some folks help me out over the years. Uh, Sammy Carlisle, you've, um, mm-hmm. you know, I've never met him personally, but I know him online and we yeah, communicate absolutely. there. Uh, he's done some weathering stuff for me. It looks, looks amazing. Yep. Uh, but I've, I've got a lot to go. Um, you know, Atherin came out with their GP 38s, 3-2s recently, got a lot of those. Walters is releasing their new uh, SW 1200 right now. So awesome. uh, people are just really cranking out the Katie stuff. I, I don't know why 30 some odd years later, we're, we're getting our, our day, but it, it's finally arrived. It's been great. So Yeah. Yeah. Well, get your wallet ready because here they come and it's hard to, to turn them down when you start to see your favorite railroad being produced. I have been spending my train budget, maybe plus some every <laughs> single month for a while now. So <laughs> that's that's excellent. Uh, so you're, you're out in the garage. You're starting to put this. Uh, did, did you draw out a track plan or did you kind of have one in your head? How did how did that whole process go? You know, my, my track plan was the uh, official Katy Railroad master track map from the 1980s. Mm-hmm. Uh, I already pretty much had a, an idea, a, a, enough of a memory to remember what the railroad looked like with their mm-hmm. track plan. Yeah. Uh, so right now it's, it's a condensed version, but I'm doing my best to create every turnout where there was one, every siding, um, every industrial spur. Uh, once again, things are condensed quite a bit as any layout has that issue, right, but right. Um, that, that's what I'm going by right now. And so right now, what you see on Sedalia on my layout is the exact track plan uh, as it looked in the official KD map uh, from, you know, 1985 is what the uh, the edition I have. In, in compression, were there any like painful cuts or like something that you just couldn't quite include? Or was there any of those kind of like real difficult decisions on things that you had to say, uh, I, I can't quite do it like that and had to make a, had to make a change. Uh, there were several spots and obviously, you know, I'm modeling so, so far on the section of the layout about a two and a half, three mile top section, uh, through Sedalia. And I have layout space wise right now, currently built uh, 20 feet by 10 feet by 20 feet. That's a lot of compression I had to do. Uh, one area that was a little difficult and I wish I could have done differently was having to compress the yard. Uh, mm-hmm. The yard in Sedalia was already very small and I had to, and my model, make it even smaller. Right. And so it'd be nice right now to have more space to, uh, you know, have more, more car storage. It does just fine when I'm doing my switching and needing to run around things. Uh, you know, when I, when I get the, the full layout built out, I'm going to have either St. Louis or Parsons, Kansas represented, uh, represented, and that'll be plenty of yard space when I get there. But for right now, uh, I would say 90% of my layout includes uh, boxes of all my cars underneath until I can, you know, bring out a couple dozen per time and mix them up, which kind of keeps it fresh, you know. Yeah. Yep. Uh, but I wish I had more yard space, that's for sure. 
I, th- I think we all do. I was just having this conversation and uh, uh, with, with another modeler about yards and trying to figure out yards and you know, how do you plan one out and, you know, car counts in yards and making sure you have enough room. And I know personally for me, it's like my yard's like 98%. Like maybe you could fit one or two more cars into that mm-hmm. yard and that's it, which yeah. is great because it, it makes a challenging operating area but it doesn't give you a room for expansion. And when you, when you find another car or like you, you know, maybe you recall another car in, in the history or you're trying to add something, it makes mm-hmm. it difficult when you, when you have a yard that's condensed and uh, exactly. Yeah. So I'll have more yard space at some point. Um, I wished I could have included the, the Mopac and Katie junction with the two interchange there in Sedalia. Uh, my layout track plan just kind of, goes around the curve where it's going to hit the junction and kind of dead ends at the wall. Yeah. Uh, so I know the Mopac junctions around there and that would provide even more, you know, interchange and yard storage space. But, uh, you know, that, that'll be a project in coming. That'll be pretty easy to, to get up and going as a next step for sure. Do you have any future plans for operations? I mean, I know that you talked about with the power cab that it's, you know, works great and it does for you. And you know, do you plan on uh, having an ability to share this layout with others and, and have them operate it as well? Absolutely. And I've had a lot of people asking me that. Uh, and so I've, I've already got a list mentally going on. And I've got a lot of friends that I know that would like to come see it. But sure. I've even had people, you know, email me, hey, I'm driving from, you know, St. Louis to Dallas. Can I stop and see your layout and whatnot? And yeah. s- sadly enough, right now, my work schedule, you know, working in the evenings, the opposite of when most people would be around. But right. I do plan on having operating sessions. Uh, yep. You know, the, the St. Louis sub in reality had a local every day. It had uh, one train from Dallas to St. Louis, one from St. Louis to Dallas, and a lot of weeks it had a unit coal train. So on a really good day on that line, you would have seen four trains, but most of the time, you know, two. Uh, wasn't wasn't Cajon Pass or Tehachapi, that's for sure. So. <laughs> <laughs> No, that's but I mean, it's such fun railroading and it's such fun railroading to model when you have a, you know, a, a line like that with, you know, with switching opportunities with some, maybe some traffic moving back and forth and have them uh, the, kind of the best of both worlds. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And it's kind of interesting, you know, building out these these industries. And I was thinking about this a few weeks ago. You know, I get so caught up in, in researching uh, that you kind of. I wouldn't say you disconnect from the emotional aspect of the hobby, but sometimes it's, it's just you get in the, in the, the task mode of it. And I, I got to thinking about it. it's really sad that, you know, in my lifetime, you know, in the late 80s, there were so many industries yeah. served by this railroad. None of them exist anymore. I mean, the railroad is long mm-hmm. gone. The industries are long gone. It doesn't take long for something to change very, very rapidly. And I, and I learned some of that even with uh, the the writing and producing of my book. You know, I, I visited yeah. every single town along the way. Some pictures look the same as they did in 1987. Some look completely different, but I mean, time marches on as they say. Yeah, and it sure does. And again, going back to that point, you know, if you're out there and you're, you know, you're clicking the shutter, you're, you're capturing history and eventually somebody is going to be interested in that history and remember it like you did. And, you know, it's just so important uh, to not be discouraged and think that, you know, the, the, the best days are behind, you, you know, that you're, you're mm-hmm. capturing the people that, you know, the golden era of, of tomorrow kind of thing. Mm-hmm. So definitely important to remember that. Yeah. But well, even from a rail fan perspective, it's easy to get caught up in, well, the good old days were way back when. And when I'm sitting trackside, oh, it's just BNSF or, or, or UP. They, they, everywhere you look, it looks like it's a sea of orange, you know. But yeah. to a lot of guys, that's amazing. And it's in the future, that's, they're going to look back on this as this is what they recall. And so I tr- try to enjoy today's railroads as much as possible, not get caught up too much in the past, although that's what the focus is sometimes. Yeah. It was only a couple of years ago. I took pictures of, you know, the, up in up in uh, Maine of of the Central Maine in Quebec, yeah, which is gone. Yes. And then you right. take pictures of, you know, just a few years ago, Kansas City Southern and mm-hmm. CP will never be the same. They'll eventually get repainted, and yeah. you know, the railroads that are going over to G and W paint schemes, and you know, yeah. it's, it's all changing. And you know, if you if you're able to capture it now, it'll definitely be you know a good piece of history again yeah. tomorrow. So yeah, I, I did learn that with the KCS, obviously, a couple of years back, knowing yeah. that all the merger talk. Of course, it went CP, CN back and forth a little bit, yeah, but I yeah. knew. 
it was going to be gone. So I went over about an hour away and got plenty of KCS trains and I yep. got that footage to use for, for something someday. So, there you go. Yeah. Good, yeah. good, good to put it in, uh, yeah, in, uh, in good, uh, holding so that you'll have it for, uh, someday when it when somebody's going to be asking about what, what was kcs look like what was that yeah. right there again? <laughs> can pull so, that out that's right that's right so uh, now i want to ask you, you you've you're starting to you've got this uh, layout that you're building in, in your garage when is it that you decide you know what i'm gonna i'm gonna start making some youtube videos and share it on my uh, on my uh, youtube channel when, when does yeah. when do you get that? I mean, obviously you're a broadcaster and you, yeah. you've got that part of you and, you know, being able to share it out in a unique way and, and in the YouTube videos. What, how does that all start for you? Well, you know, I would say it was kind of by accident. I, I've been creating videos on YouTube for several years. They were mostly when I would go on, on an excursion somewhere or a, a tourist train or I would visit some new location and just do rail fanning videos. they would be many documentaries, just me you know, putting together and producing, you know, this rail fan hotspot or this community or this railroad. So I've been doing that for a few years and, you know, putting out the content, you know, I, I would take breaks and people would be like, well, where's, you know, we, we like your content. We like your videos. Where's it at? But it had to be when I would go on a trip somewhere, you know, right. when I had time to travel and sometimes, you know, with work or life, you get caught up. And so if you don't go on a, a rail fanning trip, you don't have any new rail fanning videos. And, uh, I was by accident one day I decided, hey, I've got a railroad in my garage. Right. You know, there was a lot of people putting out model railroading videos and I was like, well let's let's just do a little layout tour, do a little review with some hopper cars and see where that goes. And the response I got from that was far greater than my rail fanning videos. So yeah. I'm not sure if it was that my rail fanning videos were just that bad or people were just really like the modeling topic, but I, I think the latter, I think the <laughs> latter, cause both of them are great, but your, your rail fanning yeah. video, I mean, your uh, model railroad videos are, are, are fantastic. Well, I appreciate that. And so I assembled across it and I just kind of kept on that path. And so that was, you know, a while back and we just kind of shifted focus to model railroading every once in a while. I'll still put out a railroading video. I went to the Great Smoky Mountains Railroad in North Carolina a few weeks ago, put out one about that. But I would say 98% of it is model railroading, and uh, it's great to see the response. I've, I've got more response than I could have ever imagined. I appreciate everybody's support, watching the channel, subscribing. And, you know, you put this stuff out, and sometimes you're making the videos, and you're just like, is anybody – yeah. watch this, you know, and I'm, I'm a broadcaster for a living, but <laughs> you know, why do you want to watch me? You know, am I really that interesting? And, and somebody thinks you are. So <laughs> that's always a compliment for sure. Absolutely. So the, the YouTube channel is called the main track. You've got over 8,300 subscribers, 114 videos on your channel at this point. I'll tell you what I like, and I was turned on to your channel by our executive producer here, Paul Kassar, mm -hmm. um, from Sydney, Australia, who river, models the Riverbelt line. So he's got yes. some MKT in there. He does. And, I've seen, uh -huh. um, and uh, so anyway, he, uh, he, he tells me about this, and I'm sure maybe that's why. And I'm, I'm checking it out, and I like it because your videos are, are, are quick hitters. Mm -hmm. you know, on the average, six to ten minutes perfect kind of timing it's not, not overly drawn out but you get right to the point tell yeah. me what were some of the favorite videos that you've done on the channel i really like my layout video uh updates just simply where i show people hey i've got this completed uh over the past month and i try to do those about once a month and sometimes it's just like been a, a nice documentary for me you know because yeah. you do all these little tiny projects and they really add up and sometimes you forget how far you've come. And so it's kind of a point of pride to be able to look back and say, okay, I got this done in the past month. Look at the footage of the layout from three months ago. Wow, that looks a lot different. And kind of sharing with that with folks. So people get a, a big kick out of that. Those are some of my more popular videos. Just people just taking a look at your layout as if they were a guest walking in and taking a look at the layout and just kind of showing them around. And I, I kind of like that. They're just off the cuff and I'm just kind of casual, just kind of highlighting some stuff. Yeah. And, and one thing I also enjoyed about it is that you're sharing the process, um, which is really cool. I mean, it, 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 we've seen many of railroads that are completed and, and mm -hmm. I'll and I'll I'll pitch the argument that you learn more from an incomplete layout than you do a completed layout because mm -hmm. you get to see the process and you get to understand that. You know, Rome wasn't built overnight, neither is a layout and, yeah, you know, that yeah. kind of thing where you got to go through it. For somebody that's watching your videos, what else do you hope to that they get to take away from, you know, watching the main track on YouTube? 
just the, the inspiration that, you know, anybody can do this. You know, uh, there were so many things in this hobby that I wanted to do that I could have done. And a lot of it was just, you know, a time issue. A lot of it was a confidence issue because I would see these, you know, the Great Model Railroads magazine come out and, uh, you know, you'd see stuff and you'd be amazed by that. But you're like, I, I could never do that. You know, and my layout right now doesn't look like that, but you just got to get up off the couch. You just got to start somewhere. And, uh, you know, people are looking at my layout and saying, hey, that's that's great. And then that gives me confidence to realize that, you know, I, I got up finally. I, I made the, the time for it, even if it's only five minutes one night or maybe three hours on this day. You know, just just get busy on it, you know, and uh, that's what I had to do. That's a great message. As far as the uh, the, the hobby, because I, like I talk about with the podcast, the podcast is like a hobby within a hobby. And I'm sure you see that as yes, well with uh, the YouTube channel. And yes. I, sometimes I joke that the layout suffers for the podcast. Mm -hmm. the, with you, with the, you actually incorporating, I'm up here in my office. I'm talking to folks from all over the place. So my layout's very, you know, without, you know, not in reach. But with you, you're doing videos about it. Do you find that it kind of motivates you to to keep going, to, to keep the, not only the layout going, but keep the YouTube channel full of uh, video as well? Absolutely. I would com I would completely agree with that statement uh, because I've got the motivation. I've got people. Sometimes they're nice. Hey, you know, I've not seen a video in a week or two. You know, <laughs> what, what are you working on, Mike? What are you going to show us? And so that's just kind of a nice to, you know, I need to get out there and make a video and I at first was trying to crank them out once a week, twice a week. I don't know why I thought I could crank them <laughs> out. Some some guys do that often, but yeah. I kind of burned out, not to this point of stopping, uh, but I, I realized pretty quickly on that I've got to find a schedule that works best for me. And, you know, thankfully, my viewers are not sitting there waiting for a schedule for my video to drop at a certain time, certain yeah. day. You know, they, they know I'm going to get them out there and you know, I'll, I'll put my best into them. And when I get it released, uh, it's, yeah. it's going to be the best I can do. So as you know, schedules create pressure. I know I've got to get one out every Tuesday. So it's, you know, yeah. it's trying to, yeah. you know, keep that schedule and, and, and meet it. And uh, yeah, it's good. Yeah. And I was going to say, I, I have the additional thing of, you know, I'm, I'm a broadcaster, I'm a news anchor. And so I'm at work all day long making videos yeah. and talking. And right. so there are a lot of times when I get home that I don't feel like making more videos or talking more. <laughs> yeah, you know, I just want to, I just want to be quiet, you know, yeah. but uh, it, it's a curse and a blessing having that as a career. You know, yeah. I, I've got the technical ability and sometimes I'm just like, well, I'm getting off of work. I'm already in the mode. I'll just, just do it right now. Get it out of the way. Um, but yeah, that, that's been a, a double-edged sword, I think. It kind of goes along with the kind of the question I've asked of, you know, those that are prototype railroaders, and then they go home and they model railroad. It's like, yeah, yeah, it's like and yeah, now you're doing the same thing. But on the other side, you're a professional broadcaster that's going home yeah. and, you know, making making videos for a YouTube channel. So you're kind of bringing yeah. your work home with you. But, but yeah. when it's when it's within your hobby, I'm sure it's a lot of fun, too. Yeah. Yeah. Those guys must really love trains. I'm, I, yeah. I love trains, but I'm not sure if I could work on a train all day long. But they do. I, I get it. You know, I understand. So. Yeah. I can't see doing my full time job as a hobby. So it's it's kind of fun that, uh, you know, to see to see other people that enjoy it to a point where they want to uh, recreate it at home as well. But uh, absolutely. That's a, yeah. that's a that's a deep kind of love. That's for sure. Yeah. And in the deep kind of love for you, too. I mean, like you said, to stay motivated enough when you're when you're working all day long in front of the camera to get back in front of the camera and then do all mm -hmm. the ed editing is not easy. If anybody's ever tried it, it's you know, yeah. it's, a, it's a long process. It's not just record and put out. There's there's a lot yeah. of back work to it. So um, that 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 must be uh, you know, a challenge in itself to do balance you know, personal life, the work mm -hmm. life, and then, you know, the, the, the layout life, and then also be able to put these YouTube uh, videos yeah. together. Yeah, we, we make it work. It's working. It's, it's chugging along, no pun intended. So <laughs> <laughs> no, that's great. That's great. <laughs> yeah. So uh, let me ask as we're getting close to wrapping up here on around the layout. So what's your next uh, major addition for the Sedalia subdivision? So the next uh, section I'm working on, I, I have enough of Sedalia completed. Uh, so now I am working out uh, toward an overpass over Highway 65 out toward Green Ridge, the next town up. It's about, uh, I'd say about 12 miles from Sedalia. Another grain elevator there, another couple of industries right there. And so um, that's the next segment that I'm building. And I kind of talked about in the layout that I'm, I'm getting toward that. Interestingly, in the, uh, I have the elevator 
for Green Ridge done already before that part of the layout's already done. That yep. Kind of a theme I have, building <laughs> structures before I have a place on the layout for it or that section of the layout's even done. But I've got that done. So it's kind of nice to have that done to realize Hey, that's going to be sitting right there. It's going to look. It's going to look well. So yeah, it's nice to have that done. And do you find yourself maybe in modes where it's like, hey, I'm in a, I'm, I'm in a, like a building mode. Like I'm going to do buildings right now or track laying, and you know, can kind of go back and forth. Do you find yourself doing that? I do, I do, and it's nice to kind of get in, I guess, assembly line mode. You know, it's I will get a lot of stuff done at once. You know, if I'm in a track laying mode, for instance, or ballasting, you know, I will just I will go with that for, you know, a week or two or however large the job is. Right now, I'm re-decaling some cars, doing some patch outs and some new uh, reporting marks on some cars. And I've been doing that for two or three days. Yeah. Uh, so um, you just got to you got to cycle it around. But I, I do like, yeah, well, one track mind just going forward until you, you get something done. So, yeah, it's like kind of getting on kicks of things, you know, and then you get on a roll and then, hey, I'm, I'm knocking this out. And especially when you're starting to have some success with it, it definitely mm-hmm. helps. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, yeah, just just rolling along, doing the best. So, yeah. Awesome. Well, Mike, I want to appreciate I appreciate you coming on around the Thank layout you. and sharing your story with us. Well, thank you so much. As I mentioned, it was an honor to be on the show. I look at the layouts of so many guys you've done episodes with. And once again, I'm like, man, I'm, I'm nowhere near that uh, level yet. But it's an honor to, to have you look at my stuff and think that, you know, hey, I'm good enough to be on your show. That makes me feel proud. So I appreciate that honor. So we, we love sharing stories from around. And you certainly have a very interesting one in the travels that you've made. And, you know, now that you're sharing it out on the YouTube channel again, everybody check that out. We'll we'll share links here on the uh, show notes and uh, we'll uh get that link to you so you can guys can go check out the main track subscribe to that and check out his videos amazing stuff and then we'll also share some uh photos of his layout up on the uh, uh, facebook page as well so go check that out and, and check that uh see that Ray, it's been awesome thank you so much it's been a pleasure i love talking i do it for a living but anytime i'm gonna talk about trains uh, that's even better thank you for joining us for this episode of around the layout Learn more about today's episode, check out past shows, and much more on our website, aroundthelayout.com. Show your support by becoming an operating crew member at aroundthelayout.com slash crew. Follow us on social media, aroundthelayout.com slash social. And send us your feedback, aroundthelayout at gmail.com. Thanks for hanging out with us, Around the Layout. <laughs>